Not too long ago, I went to the Elizabeth and Mary exhibition at the British Library. The British Library always has some type of exhibition of its print collections arranged around a particular theme, which makes sense when it has every book ever in English. The Elizabeth and Mary exhibition was pretty exciting, not only because it is the first to consider Elizabeth I of England and Mary Queen of Scots together in an exhibition, but also because it was developed by a bunch of early modern academics who consulted a bunch of written records and correspondence that hadn't been looked at too much before. I was intrigued, and I decided to take you guys with me to check it out. The exhibition is kind of, um, over now? I tried to get this video out quicker, but instead I took my time appreciating the work that went into this exhibition. Cause wow, there are so many letters to read. I thought it looked like a small circuit when I arrived, until two hours later when my brain was so fried of information I could no longer tell you a Lord Burley from an Earl of Essex. And that was before I went to read the Tronky exhibition book. A lot happens in every century, but I swear the 16th century is something else. And then I got obsessed with what was really a side note in the exhibition, letter locking. What is letter locking, you ask? Well, it's a series of tucks, folds, and twists that you can perform on your highly secret and important letter to keep it out tamper-proof. The letter itself is the envelope and the seal. It explains all the mysterious holes in some letters. And to make it even more exciting, around the same time as the exhibition's development, the study of letter locking has become a research field in its own right. Forget trying to come up with a new interpretation of the same letters that have been poured over for hundreds of years. Now it's all about reverse engineering how the letter was folded in preparation for its journey to recipients. Well, I thought it was cool. The British Library is the hub for everything literature and books, and just everything that has ever happened on this island since people started writing it down. It only has like 200 million things in its collection and 400 million books. I'm not even exaggerating. If you request a particular book for your visit, then there is this whole underground operation to locate it for you and manoeuvre it to the reading rooms. But don't worry, if you have no idea where to start, then there's loads to look at without entering the reading rooms. And I got to peruse all of them because Intelligent Me didn't pre-book tickets and I had to wait nearly two hours for the next available slot. Here is the biggest stamp collection in the world, and here is an early printing press. Ah, I swear the internet discourse all began. And the never-ending tower of bookshelves. Even the most extensive bookstagram account could not compete. Books everywhere, even books to sit on. And being surrounded by so many clever words I can never read in a lifetime because Twitter exists, I started to get hungry. British Library Cafe Review In case you don't know, the British Library's cafes are famous among humanities students. I can't even comprehend the number of dissertations and theses that the British Library catering has brought into existence. It might as well be an expected part of the acknowledgements. There's no time for cooking when you've been trying to read the same poorly written, barely legible sentence for four hours. Alternatively, having an afternoon coffee and cake counts as working, right? I mean, you're in the presence of the research material. Basically the same as reading it. My aim was something healthy, before the cake. And something non-extortionate, because this is the realm of student living. On maintenance loans and measly stipends, nourishment and cheapness is the cafe's scholarly duty. And friends, I was not disappointed. There was soup! Reasonably priced soup! I was taken aback in shock. And then I saw all the vegetarian options, and the suspicious vegan scotch egg. But back to the soup. The nourishment I felt in my bones when I tried it out. It's not just soup, it's a public service to academia. And look at the view, it's unrivaled. And then it was time for the part I really came for, the cake. There were so many, I could barely choose, and this was just one of the cafes. And there were even vegan cakes, so no one is left out. I went for this blueberry banana cake, and just look at the cute little box it comes in. And the tiny flowers! And it was actually good banana bread! With blueberries, the best fruit! I wanted to go back for more, I mean, hello, donuts. But I resisted, because I went for seconds at every cafe with amazing looking cake, then I would start to have problems. So now it's time for the overall score. I mean, is it even a question? It's wins all around for deliciousness and affordability. The saviour for researchers of all kinds. And with sustenance successfully acquired, it was finally time to enter the exhibition and to learn all about Elizabeth and Mary. They both looked so regal and content in their portraits. I'm sure they had calm and happy lives. Elizabeth I and Mary Queen of Scots were two 16th century ladies who through a rare dynastic accident found themselves queens at the same time of their two neighbouring countries. 
This might have worked out, except they were also on opposing sides of the religious divides of the time. Plus, they were the first long-term crowned queens in England and Scotland, and so there was no precedent about how to handle things like being the ruling monarch while also a wife and a mother in a patriarchal society. Elizabeth and Mary made different choices in response to their unique situation, and of course it worked out very differently for them. For two women with such unusual power for this time, it was surprising to me that this was the first exhibition directly comparing the two. Previous comparisons between Elizabeth and Mary have come from film stories about their lives, where they are often presented as rival monarchs who represent opposing versions of femininity. Elizabeth is a lone monarch, independent, unloving, and unwomanly. Meanwhile, Mary is the embodiment of femininity, and this leads to her downfall. Which queen is seen as the most successful female monarch depends on views about femininity at the time of the film's release. The first film adaption was the 1936 film Mary of Scotland, which played into all the notions of the two queens representing opposing versions of femininity. The controversial parts of Mary's rule are smoothed out to make her seem completely innocent and incapable of making decisions without a man. For maximum contrast, Elizabeth is seen as stoic and unloving and unfeminine, but a much more competent leader. And yet it is Mary who the film places as the most successful queen who manages to find happiness in femininity that Elizabeth can't. Zoom forward to 2018, and the film Mary Queen of Scots has a different portrayal of the two queens. Mary is now a strong female ruler, who leads troops into battle, while Elizabeth can't do anything to save her cousin for execution. The two queens have a mutual respect, and instead it's outside forces that stop them living with solidarity in the peculiar position of being powerful women in a patriarchal world. This exhibition takes a similar view of Elizabeth and Mary. The tagline is, Royal Cousins, Rival Queens, which embodies their relationship. All they wanted to do was have a chat about queenship and all their courtiers causing them headaches. But instead they had to contend with the unruly politics of religious reformation. It's simplistic to say that Elizabeth kept hold of queenship because she didn't marry. Mary has some big factors against her, like growing up away in France and being Catholic, which wasn't so popular back home. But looking at how marriage had fared for other Queen Marys in her life, you can see why Elizabeth was reluctant towards the idea. Elizabeth and Mary never actually met each other, but they corresponded by letter for decades. The exhibition puts these letters on display alongside many other examples of print culture to explain their complicated queenships. They were desperate to meet and nearly did a couple of times, but circumstances prevented it. Instead, they asked others for details about the other including their appearance and how it compared to themselves. They sent each other portraits and miniatures and they signed off letters to each other as your good sister and cousin. They felt a closeness, despite the distance and the imprisonment, that could only come from being the only two people in their world who could know what it was like to live each other's lives. Instead of being direct rivals as ruling queens, they were rivals by circumstance. The same circumstance that made Mary's husbands undercut her rule because they thought they should take on more power as husbands to do a queen. And the same circumstance that forced Elizabeth to sign her cousin's death warrant to ensure the security of her own throne as an unmarried queen. The exhibition gives a glimpse into the royal and rival lives of these two women through the objects, books and letters, but mostly books and letters on display. But there are some issues that arise from displaying print culture, mostly the what the heck does any of this say problem. The exhibition got around this barrier using a mix of multi-sensory tools like audio recordings of the Queen's words and interactive tablets that highlight where certain passages and words are on the letter. You'll be a paleography expert by the time you've walked out the door. It was well done, but nothing too new. Instead, what interested me was the side notes of how letters existed in the times between writing and sending, reading and storing. Because something that is rarely, until now, considered is that letters don't spend their whole existence as flat objects. They are folded and secured and ripped apart and burned and stored somewhere and all of that happens before a conservator arrives to fill all the holes that have formed from that extensive journeying. Often we see archival letters as flat pieces of writing or bound into a book for storage, but that's not how they spend the majority of their working life. And thinking of letters not as flat objects, but as foldable and multiple objects might help us understand more about their contents. Many letters have mysterious holes and pieces missing, which might have been filled in at a later date, but actually they tell us about how the information inside was secured and or how it signified itself as important correspondence. Envelopes didn't exist then, so the letter itself was used as a seal, and not just by folding it up with a bit of wax. That wouldn't be tamper-proof enough. They used a process called letter locking, which happens to be an emerging field of study. Historian John Guy once said that Mary Queen of Scots' last letter was a tear-stained mark of grief for the end of her life, 
but now we know it was carefully sealed using a process called spiral locking, suggesting a clearer mind when she settled her affairs. Spiral locking involves scoring the middle piece of the letter loose before folding the letter into a narrow strip. Usually a tool known as a bedroll would have been used to pierce a hole all the way through the letter, but Mary had limited resources while in prison, so may have used a knife instead. Another hole was made, and this process was repeated so the loose piece formed a spiral rotation until it could be sealed with wax or a little bit of water to make the natural paper fibres expand. And now the letter could go to its recipient, safe with the knowledge that no one could open and read it without tearing apart the spiral seal. Because paper at this time was handmade, it always looked a little different, so attempts to fill in the hole after unauthorised opening would look fairly obvious. Letter locking was a popular way to seal letters. We can see people using it from unknown writers to Catherine to Dimitri. It didn't just have to be for letters with secretive information. More complicated seals with more spiral rotations might have been used to signify important letters because great care had gone into their sealing. Studying the way a letter is sealed can help decipher the intention of the words inside. The problem is that seals are meant to be broken, so you have to guess how it broke and then reverse engineer the technique until the holes match with the originals. Also, over the years, the holes might have been mistaken as damage to the letter, so they might have been filled in and repaired. This isn't necessarily a bad thing, because filling in a huge hole down the middle stops someone accidentally tearing it every time they flip it over. One thing I'm wondering about letter locking is what kind of interception methods was Sir Francis Walsingham, Elizabeth's chief spymaster, using to intercept the letters? We know that Mary could and did use spiral locking, and that she sent her secret letters through barrels sent in and out of her prison. Walsingham had spies copying resealing the letters along the way, and that is how we uncovered the Babington plot to kill Elizabeth that led to Mary's execution. Was Mary not locking those letters in the same way? Maybe she thought they were securing the barrels, or letter locking was reserved for more formal communication. Maybe Walsingham had a way to open letter locks without damage. There is much more to learn about in the land of letter locking. I will definitely be following what the Unlocking History Research Group do next. They've already categorised letter locking techniques and read an unopened letter using x rays without breaking the seal. I hope you enjoyed this International Women's Day edition of my museums videos. So much has already been said about those 16th century queens, and yet the exhibition still keeps things fresh. If you want to see more museum vlogs and historical video essays, then don't forget to subscribe. See you again next time!